Unfortunately, he didn't go into any details because he was not the kind of guy who wrote things down very much, unfortunately. But he created this coral castle, um, which is the most remarkable device. Um, it's, it's basically if you can, you can go and visit it today. It's it's now got new owners, and um, you can actually go in there today and see it. Um, if you're ever in Florida, please, it's a it's a homestead in Florida on south of Dixie Highway. Please do go and see it if you can. It's a fascinating place. It's one of the few buildings in Florida that was not in any way damaged by Hurricane Andrew. That's actually in 1997. People actually took shelter inside that building during Hurricane Andrew in 1997, which devastated Florida. This was one of the few buildings not damaged. Um, it's so perfectly built that there was a revolving door made out of a 10 ton block of coral rock, which was so perfectly balanced that a child could push it open, it would, it, would it would rotate. Now unfortunately Coral Castle was dismantled and moved to a new location. And when they put the revolving door back on again, they couldn't get it to turn. They spoiled the, the perfect balance that Leeds Callan had achieved. And now they've had to prop it open and put a new gate outside. Next slide please. Now while uh, Edward Leeds Callan was busy building Coral Castle, this guy in Austria was busy watching fish swimming in the river. This is Victor Schauberger, and he um, was an Austrian forester. And what he noticed something very, very interesting about fish. He got to know the forest very well, got to know the the environment very, very well indeed. And one of the things he noticed was that fish, under certain conditions in rivers, when the water is a certain temperature and a certain flow, the fish can actually move without flicking their fins. And he worked out that they were using the energy from the water itself. They're extracting energy from the water. Um, for, actually, this is free energy from the zero point field. They were extracting through their gills by making the water rotate in certain patterns. And um, it's really quite an amazing thing because he, um, what he's basically saying is that this is something, this is life, this is an, a fish that has evolved to use free energy. Now he built several devices like a trout turbine he called it, which is very, very simple to do. Um, as I said, you, you don't need complicated engineering. It's basically just an unusually shaped pipe. But he managed to get this free energy effect using water from this pipe. And he built several log flumes and other things like that. Now in 1938, the Nazis annexed Austria and they offered him a job. And he don't say no to the Nazis, unfortunately. So he did go and work for the Nazis. This has been used to discredit him. But from what I gather, he was an unwilling accomplice. He just did it because if he'd said no, he'd have ended up in a camp or something. So he worked for the Nazis building various devices which maybe we'll come to because maybe this is a very, very important point because um, the Na Nazi technology in World War II was way ahead of the rest of the world. We know that they were building, cru they had cruise missiles, the, the Doodlebug and the V2 rocket, which is a missile which they used to bombard London. That's just the start of it though. They were, de they were de developing free energy devices. And I believe that when the war ended and the Nazi regime was destroyed, the victorious allies took this technology back to their homelands and continued to develop it in secret. With the help of the scientists, the Nazi scientists were smuggled out of the country under false identities with Operation, in Operation Paperclip. Britain got some of them, the Soviet Union got some of them, but America got most of them. We know that Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist, who built the um, Saturn V rocket which uh, took men to the moon, or maybe didn't, depending on your point of view. That's a subject for another talk. But um, the, this Saturn V rocket, this huge space rocket that took men into space, um, Werner von Braun designed that. But maybe there was a more, maybe there's more. That's the point. There's a guy called Nick Cook, who's uh, written a couple of books, and he's made some TV shows about this. Next slide, please. Now, every so often, it doesn't happen very often, but this cover-up is not perfect. It sometimes loses its grip, and one day in 1989, the cover-up of free energy almost failed. This is um, Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons going public in 1989, declaring that they had created something that they called cold fusion. Now, it wasn't their idea to call it cold fusion, there's a, and there's a long story behind that, and I think these, there was an attempt to put this genie back in the bottle as soon as it was out, and the cold fusion thing was a part of that. But basically these guys have been doing a chemistry experiment using a system that a schoolboy could do almost. It, electrolysis. It's something you do in science classes in your first year. Um, where you put little 
electrodes in beakers of water with solutions in them, put, turn the power on and see what happens. They were doing this to us test tubes of deuterium, that substance which um, is used in nuclear fusion. And they couldn't, believe, they couldn't believe it when they suddenly found that the water the substance started boiling and bright light appeared in it. Energy, heat and massive amounts of energy was being released. So much energy that it couldn't be a chemical reaction. And they put it down to some kind of nuclear fusion. Now this, it turns out this wasn't actually something they discovered. This was something that um, has, was actually first observed in 1921 and um, several times since, and it was called the anomalous heat effect. But they basically rediscovered it, they discovered it independently. Um, now, I don't know if any of you remember this, and there's lots on, online you can look about the history of the coal fusion scandal. But basically, this was a massive news story across the world for about a week. A scientist rushed to repeat the experiment, and then, way ho, the, the announcement is made, oh, it's nothing. It's, it, it was a mistake. Pons and Fleischmann, they messed up. They made a massive error and they're very, very sorry. And we're very, very sorry too that we even believed them. And um, this was basically the General Ramey empties the Roswell saucer story. It was all then, it was all forgotten about. But the thing about it is, I mean, these, there's been attempts to, this has, interest in this has been revived every so often and there was an attempt to debunk it further with a, in 2005 with a BBC Horizon episode called An Experiment to Save the World where they, they made a big song and dance out of the fact that they didn't detect any neutron radiation coming from the from their experiment. The thing about it is they said it's not fusion it's not nuclear fusion power. And it should never have been called cold fusion. But it doesn't matter in a sense it doesn't matter. But the point is that heat was being released. If heat is being released from a process and you're getting a massive amount of overunity, all you, you can you can run that heat and, and it can it can warm up a boiler. The boiler can spin a, dyne, a turbine. The turbine can spin a dynamo. You have power. You can work out the, what's causing it later. You have usable energy source. There are still mysteries associated with electricity. It doesn't stop us using it. Next slide, please. So, what would it mean? This is the this is the thing. What if you've never contemplated this question before? You need it'll take you a while to get your head around it. What would it mean if we had this technology available to us right now? What if we had been allowed to use it when it was invented almost 150 years ago for the first time? What kind of world would we be living in now? And you have to, like I said, sit back and think about it. We're living in a world in which you could have a, a box, a device, with no moving parts, very low maintenance, that costs 80 pounds. You could install it in your house and it would provide you with electricity for the, to run your house. Clean, safe, completely free, forever. You could put it in your car and you could drive around the world just stopping for lunch without, any, without stopping for petrol or paying a penny on fuel. It was interesting, it was Gary McKinnon, the, the, the hacker, who um, was, thankfully he's not going to be extradited to the USA, he's not even going to be prosecuted in this country. I consider him a hero, not a criminal. It was the, the plight of old people who die in the winter time because they can't afford their heating bills that inspired him to hack into the Pentagon, uh, hack into NASA and the Department of Defense and find out if they had any details about free energy and UFOs. It was this obscenity, it was the obscenity of the world as it is where we're using this stone age, this, this stone age power source in a 21st century world. So it would basically it would eliminate poverty in this country and across the world. I mean for instance there have been the famines that happen. You could with free energy, you, you, the, the problems of food production would be solved. You could actually set up farms in places you can't now, for instance in the middle of a desert, because you could get all the water you needed from the sea. And of course you can't do that now, for several reasons. Sea, of course, sea water of course is salty, you can't put that, you can't drink it, you can't put it onto farmland. But you can desalinate seawater, you can remove the salt, you can filter it out. It's, it's not hard to do that. The problem is it costs a lot of energy to desalinate seawater. With free energy, you could do it for nothing, and you could pipe it, you could pump it inland 
thousands of miles into the heart of the Sahara Desert or into the Australian outback and you could irrigate the farmland there, maybe using Schauberger's coils. Maybe using Schauberger's coils to pump the water by one of his flumes. There are also things such as, um, there are various kinds of natural fertilizers like Ormus and Terra Preta which also have been kept from us, which increased the yield of farmland a dozen times over. It sort of eliminate hunger. There'd be food for everyone. You wouldn't have this West Third World split anymore. There wouldn't be a Third World anymore. It would be, we'd all be the same. Next slide, please. It would end pollution. And all the environmental destruction I've talked about would no longer be effective. There'd be no need for it anymore. Because we would no longer be polluting the air and the water with the noxious exhaust of combustion. Nor would we be poisoning future generations with the, uh, the glowing, sinister plutonium rods lying in the ground, waiting to be discovered, waiting to leak out. It's, it's, interesting, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I, live with, I live with three guys who come from the Sudan. They're lovely chaps. Um, they, they're here in this country they just because life in this country is better. They can earn more money. Their country's a dust bowl. There's mass poverty in the Sudan. I worked out on the back of an envelope that just one mega cell, that's, that, that's a form of a fusion free energy device that was invented by Stanley Mayer, could turn, no, just 10 of them, sorry, just 10 Stanley Mayer cells could turn the whole of Sudan from a dust bowl into a land flowing with milk and honey. That one country could feed all of Africa let alone the rest of the world. And you don't, you, you're not limited to just 10, you can have 100, you can have 1,000, you can have a million, you can have as many as you want. And, um, well, I mean, on the subject of immigration, I mean, um, I, don't, I don't get angry with people for wanting to come and live in this country if their own countries are so bad. I just think to myself, well, why is it happening? What's the solution? And if, if life was improved in their own countries, they, would, they, they wouldn't want to come here. And in fact, I can see in the future, what, in once free energy is um, declassified. It could be that we, Britons, <laughs> people living in, these, in, in the British Isles, with all this wet and windy weather around us, we'll want to go to get our place in the sun. And it'll be countries like Sudan that will have an immigration problem because we'll be moving there. That's the thing, isn't it? Now you could say, well, what's that going to do? Eventually that's just going to fill up the earth because population will continue to expand. And of course the bioeconomic capacity of the earth is I think that if you take into account the energy we use, um, I believe, and, and the, in a sense that the, the environmental destruction and lack of resources is caused by our, our use of fossil fuels, our, 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 the fact that free energy is not available to us. So it's not our numbers, it's not our population that's the problem, it's the, it's the way we live, it's our lifestyle. I think if we improved our lifestyle by using free energy, then the bioeconomic, the bioeconomic capacity of the earth will be vastly increased. I mean, it's not been calculated, but it could be ten times what it is now. Uh, it's not infinite, of course. The Earth is not infinite. But with anti-gravity, we could go out into space. We, we could, we could colonise other planets. We could live on other planets. And we need, in a sense, we need that. Because despite what you see in sci-fi with these rockets flying around the universe, these rockets that laboriously, these, these chemical rockets that chug their way laboriously up into space, into low Earth orbit, um, you could not colonize other planets with this with these rockets but with anti-gravity you could fly to the moon or to Mars with the ease of getting in a car and driving to Cardiff we could spread out into the universe the infinite universe so next slide please so let's go back to Heinberg's graph as we can see here, this is the situation we're in today with resources plummeting at the same time as population, energy production and environmental destruction is rising. And as you remember when I previously showed you this set of graphs, in Heinberg's pessimistic model this eventually resulted in massive population and environmental destruction and zero resources which then led to the fall. But let's just imagine that free energy was declassified at this point. Now, I'm going to I'm going to say not, I'm going to, like I said, I feel optimistic, I'm going to put it slightly in the future. Next slide, please. Free energy disclassified at this point. What happens? Heinberg's graph is transformed 
in the first place population sort of levels off now this is the size that this is going to happen anyway it'll level off at a at a, at a, a position which is lower than the bioeconomic capacity of the earth so we wouldn't we wouldn't be damaging the earth with our numbers secondly resources would once free energy is declassified resources could recover back to their pre-civilizational levels and once the in, once the harmful lifestyle of fossil fuel use is removed environmental destruction plummets it goes back down the earth heals itself till it's back to its pre-civilizational level so the question is though, where on that graph do I put energy? Next slide please. There's nowhere I can put it on there. Infinite energy. That's why it's sim the infinity symbol. That's the only thing I can write on there. I can't put it on there as a line. There's as much energy as you want. So in summary so far, we have a lack of resources, we have a pathological and primitive energy system which has caused human suffering and the destruction of the earth. None of it is necessary, all of it is preventable. So why? If, it's, if that's the case, why is this preventable disaster being inflicted on us? Next slide please. Earlier on I mentioned Nikola Tesla. Did these bankers destroy Tesla to stop his gift of free energy for all? That's a rhetorical question, I think. J.P. Morgan, the Warburg family, the Rockefeller family. These families are still major power brokers in America today. Where, um, look, um, one of the um, Rockefellers was once asked, oh, it was Nelson Rockefeller, who was, or one of the Rockefellers once asked if he wanted to run for president. He said, I don't want to be president of the United States, that would be a demotion. And it's true. The reason we don't have free energy is because the world is controlled by forces, political forces, political individuals and could, who use free energy for control. They use they use the, the with, they withhold free energy for the purposes of control. The distribution, the rationing, the um, control of energy supply to the people is quintessential for their power. It's quintessential for, for the status quo, which puts them in their position. It's a fundamental means of wielding power. I don't know why they want to do that. I'm not them. I don't know what goes through their head. But everything I discussed before, when I was discussing the Heinberg graphs and everything like that, is a fraud. It's a, it's a construct. It's a lie. And it's been maintained by these people. Now, in terms of penetrating the structure of the, the breakaway civilization, as Richard Dolan calls it, or whatever else you want to call it, the men in black, the Illuminati, in order to penetrate this, this power structure, you need to realize that there are some people in it who are not initiated into the, tr the secrets. Some of them, like I've explained, are people who believe the earth is about to be destroyed and there's nothing we can do about it except int introduce a new world order to save the planet, as I, as I discussed before. Others are what I call the outer party. Now, this is, 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 is going back to George Orwell in 1984. He uh, envisioned the world in which the, most people were proles, that's you and me, ordinary people, and the, the world was controlled by the Ingsoc party. There was an inner party that knew everything, and an outer party of lesser bureaucrats. The outer party, I don't believe, want to build a new world order. The outer party are basically people, maybe, who are motivated by greed and self-interest and they may be addicted to um, getting as much money and possessions as they can. Um, I'm talking about people maybe who are in charge of oil companies. Now free energy would not be good for oil companies would it? I mean you, you, you'd basically be going up to the chairman of Royal Dutch Shell and saying sorry your services are no longer required. What's he gonna say? No problem. We'll adapt. We are a creative company. We can go up, we can enter other markets. You still need oil to make candles, you know. Shell candles. Yes. They can be pretty, they can be bright colours. They can be nice, smell nice and not burn your wallpaper. Not stain your furniture. Yeah, shell candles. That'll be a big dollar, won't it? Everyone will want one of those. Of course not. Of course not. They know the situation. 
Ah, and now I should point out the skeptics. At this point, the skeptics in the saying, there's no such thing as free energy. All right, it is a big for all these things. It's a lie. It's a delusion. It's a conspiracy theory. Don't believe it. Um, and what they'll say at some point, there's this guy called Eric Krieg. He's got this really annoying voice. He's, he's probably, he goes, um, why don't these inventors of free energy, instead of, um, why don't they just start selling their free energy? If they have this, these machines, they could start selling it right now and make a fortune. And what's more, they would be able to become multi-multi-millionaires and they'd win Nobel Prizes. And it's just like naivety city, you can explain. You cannot sell free energy. This is the point. Okay, you can't, if you have one of these free energy devices, you can't go to people and demand electric bills off them. It's like going up to the skipper of a sailing ship and saying to him, I'm going to attach an anemometer on your mast to measure what the wind you use. I'm going to attach it to a meter and I'm going to charge you for the wind you're using to, for your ship. You can't do it, it's, it's just not possible. Um, it's, it's interesting that. Um, it's because, like I say, this, this cover-up can be traced back a long way. These guys destroyed Tesla, as I said when I first started just discussing Tesla. Um, Tesla was going to give his free energy as a gift to the world, and they stopped him. Um, but Tesla basically was going to sign a deal with Henry Ford, who Henry Ford, of course, was the big motor designer who built the first practical cars. Now, in 1903, this was an interesting time because he developed a mass-produced car. This was a car when you had a production line, like modern cars are, are made, which is very, very good because it meant that ordinary people could afford them. Before then, cars had been very much a luxury device. And um, what he wanted to do, he wanted to put out two lines. He wanted to put out a line of petrol-driven cars and a line of electrically-powered cars. And the electrical power was going to come from Nikola Tesla's generators. And he was about to sign a deal with Tesla. And then these guys put a stop to it. And so they said, Hen they said, they said Henry, carry on with the petrol line was shutting down this electric line and so Henry Ford went and he made his cars petrol driven cars and we're still driving petrol driven cars today hmm. I think what a lot of people these people are afraid of is change in the geopolitical order the the powers that be do not like change they like the status quo they want it to stay the same and um, free energy would transform the geopolitical order so much that they'd be scared of losing power, which, which is quite rightly, from their perspective, it's a justified fear. Very justified indeed. They'd be scared, for instance, um, as I said before, there wouldn't be no more poverty. Um, that there'd be no, the, this disparity between the rich countries and the poor countries would no longer exist. In, I imagine in such a situation, India and China would become a lot more powerful. I mean, China already is basically the most powerful industrial nation on earth now. It's overtaken the United States, in my view. Um, with China and India have a huge population, have enormous resources. In a world which is freed from the burden of petroleum, and petroleum being used as an economic tool of control, they would dominate the world. Now, next uh, slide, please. Perhaps it's something more subtle than that. It's it's at a higher level too. Um, it's about the, the psychological control of people as well. Um, David Icke, at one of his lectures, he, he said he talked about this briefly. I don't think he goes into this subject enough, but he says scarcity equals dependency equals control. Abundance equals choice equals freedom. Um, in a world of free energy, there would be a lot less to worry about. Most of the problems that are happening in the world around us are caused by our lack of free energy, and could be, or could be solved by our lack of free energy. Not all of them, but a, lot, a large proportion of our problems, that, the things that frighten us. Now, if you ask people what people are frightened of, they, they've done surveys of this, and they will say things like unemployment, poverty, I'm scared of becoming poor, I'm scared of losing my home, I'm scared... I'm scared of uh, losing my job, things like this. In other words, economic fears, fears about um, the economy failing. And as you see here, this is pretty much an illustration of it all, isn't it? Sick, health, stress, no sleep, fear, work, job, late nights, fear, payments. People in this sort of state are easy, are, are, are make obedient citizens. 
especially if the, the people we have to obey hold not only our purse strings, but our basically our energy supply. We'd be like the computer that needs an electrical supply. And if you control that supply, you, you have a lot of power over the computer. And I think it would, I really think that free energy, as I said, is quintessential to the new world order. Next slide, please. Now we're going to discuss the inner party, and I'm, this is where we have to speculate. And in a way, it doesn't matter who they are. It's what they are doing which what counts. The inner party, the, the men in the majestic twelve, the breakaway civilization, the Illuminati, whatever you choose to call them. It's a, who they are as people is not relevant, if indeed they are people. And going back to the reptilian humanoid I showed you at the beginning, um, there are. It's, it's a big story, but there is reason to actually take seriously the idea that they may not be human as we define human and they may actually be something else in and with human bodies but without human spirit um, every so often someone will point a finger they'll go it's the Jews it's the Americans right? it's not I don't I don't believe it is any particular group of people on this world that exists a, an existing culture on this or religious group on this world doesn't do any help, it doesn't help to blame people like that without any reason. It's it's a tricky it's a tricky situation and but I think at some point people like Steve Bassett who's campaigning for disclosure, I'm gonna talk about it in a, in a minute. They need to come to terms with this information. Next slide please. How am I doing for time? Ten fifteen. Alright, so this is Bruce Depart, this is um so this is Stanley Mayer, I believe. Yeah. This is Stanley Mayer Mayer in his laboratory. I, t I talked to you about the Mayer cell, the one which just ten of those could um, power the whole of the country of Sudan. Um, he's dead. Stanley Mayer is dead. He went for a meeting, he went for a business lunch with some people who were going to invest in his in his product, and he ran out into the street clutching his throat saying, They've poisoned me. And he died. In fact, um, a lot of a large proportion of these inventors is, is John Hutchison. I showed you earlier. He's one of the few left alive, actually. Uh, Bruce De Palma fell off a train when he was drunk, apparently. He was, a, he was on a moving train. He fell off a train when he was drunk. Uh, Eugene Malov was—he's um, dead. Um, there's many other examples as well. People who are either dead, or they've got their careers destroyed, or they basically shut up in order to protect their careers. <coughs> If you have a free energy invention, what will happen is you've got to be very, very careful. There's several organisations now that are, are acting as basically support groups for free energy inventors. There's one called KeeleyNet, which I think is very good. I like that one. Um, there's several others that I wouldn't trust because I think they may be government, government infiltration. You've got to ask around, contact people and see what you might think. But um, what will happen is if you, get, if you have a free energy invention, first of all, don't patent it. If you patent it, you'll be approached by some guys in grey suits who are smiling and friendly and they'll offer development. They'll, offer to, they want to, they'll ask to buy development rights or they'll want you to sign a development contract of various kinds. They'll offer you a large amount of money for it. And remember, free energy, invention, free energy inventors are very often part-time amateur creators who, who spend their free time in their garden shed, tinkering away, really, really annoying their wife and their kids because they're never in the house living in poverty, living on, on the breadline, supporting themselves through their day job. If someone offers you 20 million pounds